Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the first of three lectures to be given by Professor Miguel Paulos uh, on the uh, numerical techniques that he has been developing uh, on the conformal bootstraps. So I wanted to say a few words before uh, he starts. Um, so I have known Miguel for a very long time. So in a very uh, uh, academic sense, he is my uh, brother because we had the same PhD advisor. And uh, he did his PhD from Cambridge University under the supervision of Michael Green in 2010. And then uh, did a couple of postdocs in France, uh, Brown and CERN. Well, that's the three of the two. Okay. And uh, uh, from 2017, he has been a faculty at ENS in Paris. He has contributed a lot. Oh, gosh. Um, who has this? Okay. Uh, he has contributed a lot to the development of the conformal bootstrap. Uh, 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 to name a few, he has a software which is freely available called Julie Boots. Uh, he was on the first couple of uh, papers uh, on the 3D Ising model and many subsequent ones after that. Um, we ourselves have co authored a couple of uh, pretty well cited papers as well with Rob Myers. And uh, it's a pleasure to hear him lecture. So off you go. And uh, just uh, before you start, I must acknowledge that this is under, uh, this is being supported by the Spark uh, program P315. So off, uh, you can take it on from here. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ninda, for the introduction and for, for the invitation to give uh, these lectures. Uh, so these lectures are called the fine line. Hopefully, it will become clear wh wh why I'm talking about this uh, later on. And these are lectures basically on recent work that has been done uh, in the last uh, three years or so uh, on a new approach to the conformal bootstrap and how to examine uh, the bootstrap equations using some new tools called uh, analytic functionals. So. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't think I include almost any reference uh, uh, in, in the slides. So I'll, I'll be happy to provide uh, uh, links to papers uh, afterwards to anyone who asks, but this is built on uh, mostly on work that uh, I've done together with uh, Daniel Madzak. Uh, and uh, then I've also co collaborated and it includes contributions from other people like including uh, Aninda and uh, Gopakumar, um, Paulo uh, Sen, uh, Apratim Kaviraj, uh, so ma many people, uh, among which I've really worked on related topics. So uh, okay, so let's uh, let's start since uh, let's start. Can we start? Okay. Um, so so there's a number of uh, young people in in the audience. So. Bear with me while I'll try to review what's the motivation for studying any of this. So the starting point is perhaps the study of, of critical phenomena in a broad sense. So here's a few examples of what I would call critical phenomena. So we have the, I don't know, broccoli, I don't know the name in English, it's the Chouham Romanisco in French. Uh, there's something called Zipf's Law, which I'll mention. So here's the, the S&P 500, the, so the stock markets, the progression, how it looks like. And then we have this piece of art by Kanagawa, which shows some waves. And you can see that there's waves on top of waves, on top of waves. So there's some kind of uh, fractal st uh, structure. Um, and uh, so critical phenomena, uh, these are situations where there's an emergent invariance um, and their scales. OK, in the broad sense, this is how I would uh, see it. And indeed, it's the common point uh, among these uh, these four pictures. So you see that this broccoli, when you zoom in, there's some structure that's repeating itself. In the S&P 500 as well, you can see this is essentially a random walk. So there are fluctuations on top of fluctuations on top of fluctuations. Same things for the law, for the, the waves. And Zipf's law, in case you don't know, it's basically, if you look at the frequency of, uh, of words in a language and you sort them by their rank, uh, then the frequency with which a word appears as a function of its rank, whether it's the one that appears the most or second most or so on, it turns out to follow a power law. So here you have these curves and there's all these languages. I'm not sure if it's very clear, but you have everything from Esperanto, Portuguese, 
Croatian, whatever, all these languages, and they all fall into this curve. So this is log 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 plots. So in a log log plot, power laws they look like straight lines, and indeed you see that they all follow approximately the same line with a certain slope. So the slope is the exponent in the power law. And so determining these, these, these slopes, these exponents, is a main objective of a theorist when we're trying to understand uh, uh, critical phenomena. So here's uh, perhaps a more physically interesting uh, uh, couple of examples. So uh, uh, a simple model of a, of a magnet uh, is where you consider just some, some uh, electrons which spin up or down, which have, are coupled with nearest neighbor interactions. You can consider them on a line or on a plane or on a cube and so on. Uh, and so if you, simulate, uh, if you simulate these spins, then you find that if you tune the temperature appropriately, there will be some phase where there's large numbers of them uh, or that are lined up in one direction or the other. So okay, for instance, I don't know, the black regions here in this plot are spins which are pointing up and the white are spins that are pointing down. And so if you make the temperature very high, then this figure would just look random, you know, with arbitrary splotches of black and white. And similarly for very cold temperature, it would look almost entirely black or almost entirely white, which means that there would be a strong magnetic, magnetic field. So all the spins would be pointing in the same direction. And then there's some critical temperature, which is what I show here, where actually you can see that there are domains. So there are regions with spins pointing in one direction uh, of approximately all sizes. Okay, so again, there's this kind of uh, emergence uh, scale invariance. And so this critical temperature is if we have a magnet and you heat it up, at some point it stops being magnetic. So this is called the Curie uh, temperature. And at that point you have this, uh, this very interesting phenomena that occurs. And surprisingly, uh, actually the physics close to that point is exactly the same physics as occurs, for instance, in binary mixtures. So if you have two fluids uh, that ordinarily don't mix, you know, think like olive oil and water, so here, this is not all the volume water, it's some other two liquids, which I, which I forget. Um, and you start uh, heating, it, heating them up. You know, init initially, they are well separated. And then as you heat it up, there will be some critical temperature where the, the depth of penetration of one uh, liquid in the other starts to, to go to infinity. And so if you think of these black and white arrows as one fluid or the other, actually it turns out that the physics in these two circumstances is actually exactly the same. So there's some universality associated with critical phenomena. Um, and this is because when you reach the critical point, uh, the common uh, feature in all critical phenomena is that there are large uh, either thermal or quantum fluctuations. So this means that the, cor the correlation length, so how disturbing the system at one point affects the system at some other point, usually this is the case exponentially fast, but that criticality is the case only like a power law. Okay, so this means that the correlation length goes to infinity. And since you have something which is going to infinity, you know, so the microscopic details, they, they no longer matter. Okay? So you have correlations over very large lengths. So whether things are made of atoms or molecules or whatever, uh, stops being relevant. Uh, and indeed all scales drop out. So there's no more scale dependence in the system. And this is why you get power laws. Okay, because power laws are things uh, that arise in when you just do dimensional analysis, because their units are fixed by dimensional analysis. Uh, so again, an example is this Zipf's law that I showed you. So the theorist's job is that given some critical phenomena, we would like to compute, uh, for instance, the, the scaling exponents. There are other observables that, that we'll see later on, but perhaps one of the main tasks is computing the scaling exponents for various uh, critical phenomena. Uh, so now a crucial thing is that uh, sometimes these critical systems are not only scale invariant, but they are actually conformally invariant. So this is a hypothesis uh, made by Polyakov. Uh, so conformal invariants, uh, and you should know what, what this is, otherwise these lectures maybe are not for you. Uh, but uh, uh, so it's invariant under ch uh, changes in the metric which preserve angles. Okay, so it's not only scale invariance, there's more complicated things that you can do, which preserve angles. Um, so um, 
at the same time, since we're considering these systems uh, which have large correlation length, and we're also interested in the thermodynamic limit, of course, because these are microscopic systems, it makes sense to have a continuum description. Okay, so when you have a continuum, you'll talk about fields, for instance, fields which depend on the position in space time. So if you put these two statements together, so you want fields and you have you want uh, conformal invariance, then you are led to conformal field theories. Okay. Uh, okay, so so conformal field theories, uh, again, well, what's the motivation for understanding them? So I just gave you one, critical phenomena. This is a very important motivation. Uh, but there are other ones. Um, so if you think about more ordinary quantum field theories, then CFTs, they arise uh, either as infrared deformations of uh, QFTs, uh, or, or sorry, IR limits of QFTs, uh, or uh, they can also UV complete them. Okay, They can exist at very high energies and low energies. And of course, this is because a QFT has scales, and if you go, go to very high energy, all the scales drop out, and if you go to low energies, all the scales drop out again. So this is why you tend to have CFTs at these points. There are also, in this sense, there are simplified quantum field theories, right? Because they're just like quantum field theories, but they have more symmetry. So they are simpler in some sense, even though they are still very complicated. And uh, then we have learned in the last uh, 25 years, 20, yeah, 25 years or 24 years, um, that these are CFTs secretly sometimes can describe uh, other systems holographically. So like uh, quantum gravity or or string theory and or um, uh, they can also describe simply quantum field theories in in anti decider space. So even if there's no gravity, uh, any QFT in an anti decider space will also give rise to some uh, CFT. Um, and finally, the other reason why CFTs are interesting interesting is that it's actually possible to make non perturbative progress without extra help like in the form of supersymmetry. So usually if you have a, a quantum field theory and it's strongly interacting, there's not much that you can do. So you can simulate it numerically, or put it on the computer. Um, if you do that, some observables you will not be able to access. So it's, uh, it's a difficult uh, problem to deal with. Um, so you need some other help. And usually you, you assume something like supersymmetry, which gives you control away from perturbation theory. And CFTs are another example because the enhanced symmetries that they have will also allow us to, to make some non-perturbative statements about these theories. So this is both a, an opportunity and a, a challenge for us. Okay, so our approach to study conformal field theories is the conformal bootstrap. So what is the conformal bootstrap? Uh, so this is uh, simply an approach where um, we assume basic con consistency requirements, such as unitarity um, and the locality, locality in the form of associativity of the OP, as we'll see. And uh, very surprisingly, just assuming these two, these, two uh, these two requirements actually leads to very strong constraints in the presence of conformal invariance. Okay? So this is the philosophy. So there's no Lagrangian. There are just these basic consistency conditions, and we try to derive consequences from them. And uh, you know, CFTs are very interesting objects with lots of things that you can study on them. But here we'll focus on trying to understand the simplest possible observables in these theories, which are simply vacuum correlation functions of local operators. OK? So this. So you, you can see my mouse, right? Can, yeah, Can someone? Yes, have? your mouse is visible. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, and so the reason why these are interesting objects, for instance, is that if we know, say, the spectrum of local operators, this is the same. So we'll know all their quantum numbers. Their quantum numbers include the scaling dimensions. And these scaling dimensions are nothing but the critical exponents that I was talking about before. So this is a, already a very interesting uh, set of observables to consider. OK, so that concluded the, the motivation. So now we're going to get into in more into the details. Um, so um, next, we're going to uh, 
talk about some basic kinematics of CFTs and derive the, the bootstrap equation, or perhaps the simplest bootstrap equation. Then we'll investigate its properties and try to give some geometric perspective on this equation, which will su suggest some ideas on how to probe it. Uh, and then, to, based on these ideas, we'll argue that we can construct certain linear functionals, uh, some bases of functionals, which are kind of like a Fourier transform for this equation. Okay. Uh, so don't hesitate to stop me to ask uh, questions. Um, okay, so let's start off with some CFT basics. So I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, so perhaps one of the most important properties of a CFT is that there's something called the state operator correspondence. So what is the state operator correspondence? So if you start off with the CFT defined uh, on, on a cylinder, Okay, so where, where time is running upwards here. Um, so yeah, the time is running upwards here. And you have some state living at some fixed time. Then you can do a conformal transformation, which maps the cylinder to, to the plane. So you just take the cylinder and you blow it up, basically. And now this state lives here on some finite radius circle. So time becomes the radius here on the plane. Uh, and you see that when you do a time translation on the cylinder, for instance, if you send it to, to the past, so here the state now lives in the infinite past, on the plane, what this means is that you are shrinking this circle to very small sizes. So why is this interesting? This is interesting because if you consider a state which is an eigenstate under time translations, which here is an eigenstate of dilatations, then you know the state will be invariant under this transformation. And so what this is telling you is that those such states, states which are time translation invariants, are naturally associated to local operators, since after all, I can shrink this circle as small uh, as much as I want. So this is the correspondent, is that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian on the cylinder, which is nothing but the dilatation operator on the plane, so the thing which stretches the plane, uh, it's associated to local operators, special local operators, which are called conformal primaries. And the scaling dimensions of these operators are the energies on the cylinder. Okay, so this is just a review for the younger people who probably had some lectures on this recently. We are seeing this again. Um, so now what is the OPE? The OPE is very simple. So now if you are on the plane here and you have, say, two operators, then this also defines the state here on the circle. But since this is a it's a Hilbert space, you know, I can take any state and decompose it in a basis. And the basis, can, we, I can choose this basis to be the basis of eigenstates of a Hermitian operator, which I'll take to be the dilatation operator. Okay? So an arbitrary state, the state generated by the insertions of these two operators, can be expanded in a basis of eigenstates of dilatation labeled by the scaling dimension delta with some coefficients. So in terms of operators, uh, what this means is that if you have two operators, they can be expanded as an infinite sum over the primary operators in the, in the theory. So the primary operator is the one which have a definite scaling and, the delta, the, and are associated to eigenstates of dilatations. Okay, so in this OPE, there's an, an infinite sum over uh, primary operators, and they appear with something called the OP coefficients, which tell us how these two operators couple to this one. Okay, so what is the magic of the OP? The magic is that we can do this as many times as we want. And so if you have a correlation function with many operators, you can just keep doing this and arrive an expre at a, an expression which will basically involve sums of products of lower point functions, like three point functions. And those are determined by the OP coefficients. So this leads us to the concept of CFT data. The CFT data, what is it? It's first of all, the set of quantum numbers of all the primary operators in the theory. So we need to know their scaling dimensions, their spin quantum numbers, their ch global charges, and so on. And we know how they couple. So for each trio of operators, we need to know these coefficients. You see that if we know the CFT data, if we know these quantum numbers and these couplings, 
then we can compute all possible correlation functions. Okay, so we just use the OP many, many times, as many times as we as we need to, to end up with, you know, a two-point correlator or something like this. And all the things which will appear in this expression for the correlator will be these OP coefficients and the quantum numbers. So if you know the CFT data, you can compute any possible CFT correlator. Of course, the point is that this CFT data is not arbitrary. So for one thing, the, the quantum numbers of operators, they are bounded, they satisfy bounds, uh, namely by unitarity. So as an example, if you take operators which transform under this representation of the, of the rotation group, so this is a schematic form of the Young tableau, it's just a, a horizontal line uh, with L boxes. So these include operators, for instance, scalar or spin one or things with two indices, Lorentz indices, which would be spin two. Uh, so these are these simple representations. Then there are bounds, and the bounds look like this. So for spin zero, the dimension has to be either zero or above d minus two over two, where d is the CFT dimension. And uh, for other spins, integer, then there's a different bound which looks like this. Okay, so this is just an example of some of the bounds that, that uh, some of the constraints that arise on quantum numbers thanks to unitarity. In the special case of d equals one, which will be important for us, uh, in d equals one, there's no spin, right? There's no transverse directions in, in which to spin. Uh, and in this case, the bound is simply that the scaling dimension should be positive. Okay, so you, you cannot just take these bounds and place d equals one. Okay, you, the correct bound is this one. So this is one constraint. The other constraint. It, Miguel, can I ask you a can I ask you a question? Yes. So the, there are these uh, operators with mixed symmetry as well, which look like uh, young tableau with uh, multiple yes. rows, right? Uh, are, are the are the unitarity bounds on these operators known? Uh, I I think so, but uh, okay. you know, I, I, okay. I'm sure some of them have been worked out, but maybe not all of them. I, I'm not sure. And in this numericals uh, bootstrap, these operators have they been considered uh, so they, far? They can or, uh, yes, yes, some of them can appear indeed. For instance, when you bootstrap correlators of uh, of currents or stress tensors, you can have things which transform mm -hmm. under some, some of these other representations. Mm -hmm. So when you bootstrap correlations of things with spin, then you can get other representations uh, than these ones. So you, some of these bounds, I'm sure, have been worked out. I'm not 100% sure if all of them have been worked out. Okay. All right. Thank you. If someone in the audience knows, you can, you can correct me. So the second constraint is um, cross, crossing symmetry, or if you want, associativity of DOP. So what, is, what does this mean? So I told you that, let's consider, for instance, a four-point function of four operators, 01, 02, 03, 04. I told you that I can use DOP to get a different expression for it. So for instance, I could take the product of operators one and two and operators three and four, and then this would give me a representation of the correlator that looks like this. So the OP coefficients, here's the, the from the product of one with two, this is from the product, product of three with four, and then these are some functions which will capture the contribution of an operator in the OP to the four point function. So we'll see what this is in a minute. So I could have done it like that, but of course I could also have done it, uh, you know, I could have taken the product of one with four and two with three, and this would give me a different representation, which will involve different OP coefficients, right? So now it's one, four, and two, three. But since it's the same four-point function, these two representations have to match. So this is usually called the S channel, and this is called the T channel. And there's also a U channel where you take the product of one with three, okay? So these two things have to agree. So uh, obviously this places constraints on these on these coefficients, uh, but you know this is just a picture. So uh, let's try to arrive at an equation which will make this picture a bit uh, uh, more precise. So let's consider the simplest possible setup where the operators I'm considering are scalars, which I'll call phi. They're all equal to an operator called phi. And so uh, let, let's consider the four-point function. Okay, so the four-point function in the vacuum is this. And conformality allows us to write it in the following way. So there's some kinematical prefactors here. This delta phi is the scaling dimension of the operator phi. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's this function, g of zz bar, uh, which is an arbitrary function. Okay, this is not fixed by conformal invariance. Z and Z bar are conformal cross ratios, so they are defined uh, here. Uh, again, what's important is that they are conformally invariant. Uh, you see that there's an invariance when I swap the roles of Z and Z bar. And uh, another property is that Z bar, is, it's not necessarily the complex conjugate of Z, but if it is, this corresponds to setting Euclidean kinematics for all these positions, X1, X2, X3, and X4. Okay, so this is a way of capturing what's the independent information in the four-point function, so the information which is conformally invariant. So in this context, crossing symmetry, what is it? Crossing symmetry is basically Bose's symmetry. It means that you can swap around the positions of these fields. So if you swap fields two with four, uh, I have to get the same correlation function by Bose's symmetry. Uh, and so in terms of this function g, it just means that z goes to 1 minus z and the same thing for z bar. Okay, so this is this, this is this statement, that the four-point function should be invariant when I swap particles 2 with 4. Okay. Now let us try to understand the OP. So uh, here's the OP in a bit more detail than I showed before. So if I take these two fields phi at positions x1 and x2 and I bring them close together, then they can be written in the following way. Okay, so what are the important things here in this expression? The important things is that we have to sum over all possible primary operators. So here they are, this OK, so they label, they're labeled by K. This is some kinematical factor. Here's the OP coefficient. And then there's this, uh, this is a differential operator, okay, which acts here. And the role of this differential operator is because we want to group uh, operators into uh, primaries and descendants. Okay, so descendants are simply uh, uh, operators which uh, are given by derivatives of primary operators. So in terms of representation theory of the conformal group, they all lie in the same module. And so the, the OP coefficients of those operators are related to the ones of the primary. So if we do this, so now if you look at the four-point function and we do insert this expression twice, what's going to happen is that the expression is going to look like this. So the OP coefficient will appear twice. We only have one sum instead of two, because as you, you should know, two-point functions of operators in a CFT are diagonal. So this diagonal property kills one of the sums. And then you have basically these differential operators acting on the two-point function. So this object is called the conformal partial weight. The important thing is that these operators and this two-point function is fixed by conformal invariance. So this is purely kinematical. It means for any CFT, these objects will be the same. Okay? The important uh, quantities here are these OP coefficients. Furthermore, in the OP of two scalars, uh, this is related to an indus question, the only allowed quantum numbers of, of primary operators are delta, the scaling dimension, and what I call the spin L, because O must live in the in the represent in this representation of the rotation group. Okay, this is a consequence of the fact that these two fields are scalars. So I can take this equation and I can write it in a different way. So if I work in terms of the conformally invariant data, then this becomes that function g of z z bar. The sum of our operators now, it's a sum over quantum numbers, the quantum numbers of the operators. The OP coefficient square, I'm going to call it A. And it depends on the operator that I'm swapping. So it depends on its quantum numbers, delta and L. And the conformal partial wave becomes, so if I write it in the same way that I wrote the four-point function, it, comes a, it becomes an object which is called the conformal block, which again depends on the quantum numbers of the exchanged field. And in the way that I'm writing it, it also depends on the quantum numbers of the field phi. Although I'm omitting that dependence here, but it's, it's hidden. So again, the important point to emphasize is that these are functions which in principle we can compute once and for all for any CFT. So the important thing is really this, uh, this, uh, these OPE coefficients. Okay, so we can finally translate our picture into a, a rigorous equation. Um, so this 
equation, this uh, identity becomes the following equation. Okay, so this is our first example of a bootstrap equation. Yeah, this equation is simply demanding this property, so crossing symmetry on G, and using the OP. Okay, so what is F? F is simply the difference of the conformal blocks with Z and one minus Z. Okay, so we just take this expression, we use this identity, and we arrive at this equation. So this equation looks super complicated, right? Because it involves an infinite sum over delta. The delta is a continuous variable. L is discrete, but also infinite. I have this arbitrary set of data here. These functions, I haven't even, I told you that we can compute them, but I didn't write them down for you. In general, these are very complicated functions. Uh, so we need to try to say something. Uh, about this. And at the beginning, this looks uh, hopeless. In fact, you can say a lot of things, a lot of interesting things. Uh, and so here in these lectures, I will primarily focus on a special case of this equation where we will restrict kinematics to the line. Okay, what does this mean to the line? It means that these four operators, the correlation function of these four operators, I'm going to put them all on some co-dimension, uh, on some dimension one manifold, so on a line. And in terms of the cross ratios, this amounts to setting Z equals Z bar. Okay, so we'll only have one cross ratio instead of two. In, in this process, information about spin will be lost. Since we are restricting ourselves to one dimension, we no longer see spin. And in fact, I will do something further, which is that in practice, Instead of Im imposing the full conformal invariance, um, uh, sorry, that's a, okay. Instead of imposing the, the the full conformal invariance, I will only impose SL2R invariance. Okay. So what is SL2R? So the conformal group is this in general dimensions. It can it it can be uh, it contains this product form. It contains a factor SL2R and contains a factor which is responsible for rotations. So I'm going to ignore rotations because I'm restricting to a line. So I'll focus on SL2R. So SL2R is like the physics of the scaling dimension. Um, so in practice, what this, what this means is that it's as if we are studying um, one dimensional CFTs, okay? Because the conformal group for a one dimensional CFT is SL2R. So I'll comment on this in a second. Let me just mention now that if we impose all these restrictions, now the equation looks a bit simpler. Okay, so now here's the sum. The quantum numbers now is just the scaling dimension. There's no longer spin. The unitarity bound, you might recall that it was simply that delta should be non-negative. The sum now runs over SL2R primaries. Okay, it's not over the conformal primaries, the, all the conformal primaries. It's over SL2R primary. So there are more SL2R primaries than there are conformal primaries in general dimensions because SL2R is a subgroup uh, of the full conformal group. Okay. And furthermore, this F delta of Z, this crossing vector, which is the difference of the conformal blocks, now I can tell you what this conformal block is. It's something relatively simple. So it's just essentially a, a hypergeometric function with some. Uh, Prefect. So as I in my conventions, you see that the conformal block depends on this on the external scaling dimension, so the scaling dimension of phi. And so a lot of our time will be spent understanding this equation in great detail. Now, so let me head out some, some comments. So when the when people start hear about 1D CFTs, the, the either they get very worried or they disconnect or uh, uh, so aren't these boring or useless or even ill-defined? So the answer is all no to all these three questions. So the simplest uh, reason why um, for all these questions is that actually any conformal field theory is the same as a one-dimensional conformal field theory in a certain sense, right? Because SL2R is a subgroup of the full conformal group uh, and, and so if you have something which satisfies the crossing equations for uh, an arbitrary DCFT, it will also satisfy 
all the, the requisite properties of a D equals one theory. So, uh, you know, it's a more general, you're, you're studying a, a, least, a, a less restrictive uh, uh, set of assumptions, okay? But anything that you find that applies to one DCFTs must apply to all the other ones, even though the converse is not true. But actually, D equals one theories are also interesting in their own right because they describe they can describe actual critical systems. Uh, this might be a bit surprising because you probably all know that, for instance, the one D easing model does not have a phase transition, and in fact, in one D theories with local interactions cannot have phase transitions at finite temperature. But if you have if you allow for long range interactions, so interactions which will fall off like power loss, then there are indeed um, there are phase, second order phase transitions. Uh, so one example is called the long range easing model, where the interactions between spins are they decay as powers. And the, so at the critical point, this is described by a non trivial one DCFT, where the scaling exponents they are not trivial. I mean, it's not mean field theory. And it's this is not solved. So and you know there are many long range variations on on your favorite models, ON models, easy model, whatever. You can always just make interaction long range, and in general you can find these fixed points. Uh, and these again, these are non trivial uh, CFTs uh, that we don't understand. Furthermore, one DCFTs they also describe things like conformal line defects. Uh, so these are one dimensional. Uh, defects uh, that can appear in uh, in higher dimensional CFTs. So in examples, for instance, the 3D easing model ad admits something called a twist defect, uh, which lives on a one uh, on a line. Um, it's basically it's a defect when you go around the line, the split, the spins flip sign, uh, and uh, and so this is described by a non-trivial one DCFT, which again is not understood. Uh, in gauge theories, conformal gauge theories, you can also have Wilson lines. So there, so line defects are also described by, by the same formalism. I also mentioned that uh, CFTs describe, uh, they can describe quantum field theories in ADS. And so a 1D CFT describes quantum field theories in ADS too. So you can study these theories uh, via 1D CFTs. And, you know, finally, even if none of this was true, you could just think that you are studying some toy model for the crossing equation to try to learn something about the more complicated versions. Okay, but in practice, this is not really a toy model. This is a super complicated equation uh, with many interesting non-trivial consequences. So, questions or comments about this? Uh, excuse me, I have a question here. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. So, um, what will be the relevance of your point one in the context of ADS two CFT one duality? What what is the what the the relevance? Yeah, of the, your comment uh, number one, like uh, any CFT is a d is equal to one CFT. We can use the machineries of uh, d is equal to one CFT to analyze any other CFT. I mean, what what is the relevance in the context of ADS two CFT? I mean, can we then map uh, the CFT one to any other higher dimensional CFT to probe the structure of I mean, more structures, things like that, or am, it, it, am seems I... you're asking, it seems you are asking uh, two different questions. So what, one question is, so all the constraints that we'll find that apply to one DCFTs have to be satisfied by higher dimensional CFTs. That's okay. point one. Mm -hmm. And then indeed things that you learn about one DCFTs, they have implications for holography uh, in particular for holography of quantum, quantum field theories on ADS2, or if, if you don't do this dimensional reduction, they will also have implications for holography of, of theories that live uh, in ADSD. That's also true. So, uh, no, yeah. my question is I mean, for ADS2, I mean, we, we uh, so far, uh, as far as I know, I mean, we can always, we always use the D is equal to one CFT. So uh, according yes. to your point, can we use uh, some other CFT some to, I mean, explore some, I mean, like uh, to enrich our understanding of ADH to, I mean, from the CFT data or from higher dimensional CFT data? I mean, if no, I so have- it's the, it's the converse, it's the converse. I mean, I'm not sure how higher DCFT would help you to understand ADS2. Uh, the converse ah, okay, could okay. be true. Okay, the converse okay. could be true. I should say something very important, though. I mean, the people, uh, 
people who are interested usually in in ads2 cft really they are not interested they are not interested in that what they care about is is quantum gravity in ads or in in system in manifolds which are called nearly ads2 yes. and so this is because in all these examples uh, the common characteristic of all these applications of 1D CFT is that the 1D CFT is never local. It does not have a local stress tensor. So okay. maybe this is what confuses people often, is that uh, the point is that you can have interesting CFTs which are not local in the sense of not having a local conserved stress tensor. These, mm -hmm. They are still conformally invariant, but they don't have a stress tensor. That's it. So yeah. to, in order to have a stress sensor, for, so if you put gravity in ADS2, then this would lead to a CFT with a, a local conserved current. But actually, it's easy to see that such CFTs do not exist in one dimensional. They, they have to be topological. Yeah. So all these CFTs, fair. they are not local. Mm -hmm. But okay, they are still interesting for all these reasons. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you comment about the absence of a stress tensor? Is it simply that there are no spins in B equal to 1, or is it something more? Uh... Uh, it's something stronger. It's something uh, stronger. So yeah. it, it it would a stress tensor in one D would be some operator, a dimension one operator, which would have to be conserved. But you know, conservation in one D is just that it's a constant, uh, uh, and it turns out that this constant will have to be zero. If you work it out, it will have to be zero. Okay. So there's no conformally invariant quantum mechanics. Basically, this is the statement. There's no conformally invariant uh, quantum mechanics with a conformally invariant ground state. The ground state will always break conformal invariance. The only way around this statement is to uh, to give up locality. I see. Um, yeah. OK, so a brief recap of what we've uh, spoken about so far. So I told you that critical phenomena are often described by CFTs. CFTs have conformal invariance and they have this OPE. The OPE allows us to get all correlators from CFT data. The, uh, but the CFT data is then is con constrained by unitarity, excuse me, and the crossing symmetry. And we arrived at this simplest bootstrap equation of all, which looks like this. So it involves an infinite sum over scaling dimensions, which are critical exponents if you want. Then there's this dynamical data here these OPE coefficients, which we don't know what they are. We just know that this is positive. And then there are these functions which are fixed by conformal invariance, so we know. OK, so our job is to understand what possible things we can place here such that this equation is satisfied. OK, okay so now let's study then some basic properties of this equation. So here's this equation. So the first thing I'm going to do is split it. Um, to emphasize the following point, which is that in the OPE of two identical scalars, there is always an operator called the identity, which is a primary operator of dimension zero. Okay? So I'm going to take the first term in the sum, which is always there, and furthermore, its OPE coefficient is one, and I moved it to the right here. Sometimes I'll do this, sometimes I won't, but this is just to point out that this contribution is always there. Okay? So you cannot have a solution to this equation where all the coefficients are zero. This is what I'm saying. At least one of them is non, it's non zero. And then just a question of nomenclature the first non trivial operator that appears in the OP, it will have some scaling dimension, which I call delta gap. So it's the gap in scaling dimensions from the identity to the first non trivial operator. Okay. Then, um, let, uh, some interesting uh, property of this equation. So let me write this equation uh, in terms of the conformal blocks. Okay, so this, this equation is the same as this one. And now let me study what happens in the particular limit where I take the cross ratio to be very small. If you look at the definition of the conformal block that I gave you, it was a power times some hyper hypergeometric. The hypergeometric in this limit becomes one, so you just get the power. Okay, so it behaves like this. Every term in this sum becomes, behaves like this. But now on this side of the equation, if I take z to be small, then the conformal block in this case will behave like a, 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 log, a logarithm. So this comes from the 2f1. I have a geometric will give you this log. So but then this is very weird, right? Because here on the left, I will get powers. For instance, the identity term will be here. And the identity will blow up like z to the minus 2 delta pi. But here, I have a log. So how can 
I, from a log, how can I get the power? Because this equation has to hold. And of course, the, so the solution is that this can hold indeed, but I will have to uh, sum up an infinite number of, of contributions. So there are no solutions to this equation with a finite number of terms. Okay? I need an infinite set of non-zero coefficients a delta so that's such that this log has a chance of becoming this power. So um, perhaps one way of understanding a bit this bootstrap equation is just to look at a solution, a simple solution, and let's try to understand how that solution works. So this solution that we consider is corresponds to thinking about a special CFT called generalized free theory, uh, or the theory of generalized free fields. And if you want, you can think that this is the CFT, which is dual to a free scalar field in ADS. If you don't want to think about holography, I mean, you don't have to. Uh, this is simply the, the CFT whose correlators are defined as follows. So the two-point function is just one over x to the delta pi. So this is as usual for any CFT, this is true. But then the non-trivial statement is that arbitrary correlators, they can be just, just expanded in terms of two-point functions uh, by like in terms of weak contractions. Okay, so this is exactly like, a, so the correlators are exactly like in a free theory a free massless scalar. The difference is that the scaling dimension does not have to be uh, the value for a free theory, which would be d minus two over two. So this can be any value above that consistent with unitary. So in particular, if I think of the four-point function, there are three weak contractions. And so the four-point function looks like this. Now I put here this plus and minus sign. So what is this minus sign? I'm considering the minus sign because this field phi, since we are in, in one dimension, I could take it to be a boson or we could take it to be a fermion. Okay, so in, in 1D, the minimal fermion uh, has just one component. So it looks like a boson. It's, I mean, it's not a spinner. And so I will allow for both possibilities that this field is bosonic or fermionic. Okay. And so the four point function looks like this. Or if I translate it in terms of this function g of z, it looks like this. Okay. And I put this superscript b or f to indicate whether it's a boson or fermion with the plus for the boson. You know, clearly this function is crossing symmetric, right? I mean, if I swap z with one minus z, it remains invariant. Uh, so the non-trivial thing is that it has a good OPE decomposition. So this is what we'll check. So if we look at this correlator, so the first term in the S channel, it turns out to be nothing but the identity can hold a block. Okay, so the identity is, is present with coefficient one, as I said. And then here, you can, it turns out that you can write it and you can do this by yourself in Mathematica as a sum over conformal blocks with specific scaling dimensions and specific conformal dimensions. So basically you just do Taylor series and then you match to these two F1s and you can read off these terms. Where for the boson, the dimensions are two delta phi plus two n and for the fermion are two delta phi plus two n plus one. So this would mean in my notation that the gap for the boson is two delta phi and the gap for the fermion is two delta phi plus one. It's, it's, the, it's the first operator that appears here in this sum. So what is the meaning of these uh, dimensions? They're, the meaning is that these are simply the fields which appear in the OPE of phi with itself. And for the boson, the fields which appear, since this is a free theory, basically, are the identity, then there's phi squared. So the dimension of phi squared will be two delta phi. And then there's phi box phi. So the dimension will be two delta phi plus two and so on. And for the fermion is the same, but since it's uh, an anti-commuting variable, you have to add an extra derivative. And so this is why you get this one here. Okay. So by decomposing this function, you find this, and you also find the OP coefficients. It turns out that the OP coefficients are given in terms of a single function, whether it's boson or fermion, but it's a function which is evaluated at different values. So this function I call a delta free. So this is a function of delta. In this sum, it's being evaluated for the special values delta equals delta n b or delta n f. But the function itself, this free OP density, 
I'm not going to write it, but it's basically just some gamma functions, which you can write down. And what's interesting is that when you take very large delta, the OPE density decays, it falls off exponentially. Okay, so there's this four to the minus delta here. There's a power, and then this is four minus delta. So what this means is that since the OP coefficients are decaying exponentially fast, then the OPE, the sum, will also converge exponentially fast. Okay, and so you can check if you work this out by yourself uh, in Mathematica one day, you can see that this sum will converge to the correlator very fast. So you just need to input a few terms, you already get a very good approximation of this function. Okay, there are no questions. Again, don't hesitate to interrupt me because I know this is a lot of information. So here we are discussing a, a simple solution to the crossing equation, a simple CFD. So since this is a solution, uh, let us try to understand how this problem of reproducing this power law divergence is, is solved. Okay, how does the law become a power? And to see this, well, let us consider the sum over states at very large scaling dimension. We already know what this OP coefficient is. So it turns out that if you take a, the limit where Z is going to zero, but at the same time, you take the scaling dimension large, so delta square root Z is fixed, then this sum can be approximated by this integral, an integral over delta. This delta to the four delta phi, you see it's, it's coming from here. The exponential dependence has canceled against a similar exponential dependence in the conformal block. And then the conformal block always also contributes this factor. Uh, and so now this integral, you can do it and it gives you the, the power law. Okay. So you see that this is actually, it seems like a very general mechanism, right? Because the conformal blocks will always behave like this. They will always have the, that exponential, uh, that's four to the delta, which will have to be canceled. And then since I want to reproduce this power, it seems like this factor will also have, always have to be here. So what this suggests is that on average, whatever this means, any solution to the bootstrap equation should roughly behave as generalized free fields at large scaling dimension. So there should be some notion of average where the OP density divided by this free OP density that I mentioned, at large scale dimension, it should become one. And later we'll prove some basically what's the rigorous version of this uh, statement. Uh, Finally, finally note that uh, another observation is that if we look at this four-point function and we take the limit where z goes to infinity, so uh, I should I should have written here that uh, well, okay, this is called the Reggie limit. The correlator goes to one, or plus or minus one, so in modulus one. This is a bit surprising at first, right? Because the conformal blocks. If you look at how they behave at large z, then you again get this log, um, and, and, and there's this uh, 1 over z to the minus 2, 2 delta phi. So again, to get this behavior, you need to add up an infinite number of blocks. Uh, and in fact, you can show that uh, for here, I'm, I'm showing it for the generalized free field, but it's relatively easy to show that for any CFT, uh, a correlator satisfies this property. Okay, so it's bounded by by one, and roughly this is because uh, this large z limit is related to the the u channel OPE limit, and when you do the OPE limit in the u channel, the first term that you see is the identity, so the identity gives you this one. So it's roughly it's roughly this. So we are really taking the Reggie limit, but since we have the modulus sign, this becomes the OPE. So. Anyway, there's a more rigorous way of uh, arguing this, but uh, I just want you to keep in mind this property that correlators at large z, they are bounded by a constant, okay, which is a lot larger than what you might naively expect. Um, okay, so we've, we've looked at the crossing equation. I gave you a, a couple of simple properties. I showed you uh, one simple solution. Now let me try to give you a different perspective, so a geometric perspective on this uh, equation. So the equation, uh, I'm going to write it again like this. Um, 
so what is this equation? So the interpretation I'm going to give it is that these f deltas and this f zero are vectors in some space. Uh, and so this equation is simply, it's a linear equation for these a deltas. Okay? It's a linear equation. So you have this bunch of vectors and you want to choose coefficients such that you get this, uh, this target vector, which is the identity. Uh, the important difference is that it, this is a linear equation where the coefficients are restricted to be positive. Okay? Recall, because this, this was an OP coefficient squared. And so if I just focus on the left-hand side, I consider the full set of F deltas, you know, for, where, as I vary delta continuously. And I think of all the positive linear combinations of those vectors that I can find. Well, it's just a, a fact that if you take a bunch of vectors and you form linear combinations, they, they, they give you a cone. Instead of giving you a linear space, in general, they will give you a cone. So for instance, this sum could look like this. When you, when, when you allow all possible linear combinations, the span of, of those linear combinations would be this cone. Okay? And so whenever there's a solution to this equation, this vector minus F0 has to lie inside the cone. Okay, but now you can imagine that, for instance, if you if you make this gap too large, you might reach a situation where this vector will be outside the cone, and in that case, there would be no solution. Okay? So you would conclude that you cannot have a gap which is too large in order for consistency with unitarity and the crossing equation. Okay. So, uh, and indeed, this is, this is what happens. So there is a mechanism like this at, at play. But, uh, you know, so here I just drew a picture. But these Fs are really functions, right? So in which sense are they vectors? Well, this is hard to, to, to see. But let us try a more algebraic approach. So even in this picture, you see that in the case where the identity is separated from the other vectors, one consequence is that I can draw a line that will put the identity on one side and all the other vectors on the other side. Okay. More formally, there exists a, a, a hyperplane. In general, it would be a hyperplane instead of a line, which I called omega, uh, which separates both sets of vectors. So this is the this is the key. This is the key is to think in this more algebraic approach. So a hyperplane is nothing but the linear functional. Okay, so if the f's are vectors, the hyperplane is a, it's like a covector. It's something which dots against the vector, so it's a linear functional. Okay, and it acts on these vectors, the crossing vectors, in some way. So I'm going to define this to, to abbreviate the action of the linear functional on f delta as omega f delta. It's a linear functional, so it's you know if you have a sum, it, the sum will, will will go outside here. And so in this problem of, of uh, getting a bound on the gap, what would we want then? We would want that when the functional acts on the identity, it should be strictly positive. And when it acts on the other vectors, it would be non-negative for all delta above the gap. So even without the picture, you can see that this implies a bound. Why? So let's just take the crossing equation. So ideal, you want this sum to be equal to 0, right? Let us act with the functional here. It's a linear functional, so this becomes this. And now let us use our assumptions. The assumption is that there's a gap delta G and there's an identity. But now the function on the identity is strictly positive. And here it's not negative. So the conclusion is that this whole thing cannot be zero. But if this is not zero, then this can also not be zero. And hence, there is no solution to the bootstrap equation. So the conclusion is that if you can find a functional satisfying these con conditions, then you can find a bound on delta G on the gap. And this is a universal bound that would apply for any CFT. But, but you, you only need omega uh, on any one of these operators, not just identity. Right? Couldn't I have been in a situation where omega zero was greater than or equal to zero and omega delta, maybe one of the operators was bigger than zero strictly or? Uh, you, you could choose indeed. You could choose some other operator. It's just that you know, in in for for a general CFT, you need to know that the operator is there in the spectrum. Exactly, right? you would need to know that the operator is there. So if you assume that, then yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. 
But what we know for sure is that for any CFT, there will be an identity and there will be some gap. So this is a, a better, a more convenient formulation. But uh, you're right. All right. Yeah. So um, now let us let me tell you what an extremal functional is. So I'm, I've I've spoken to you that using functionals I can derive bounds, but surely there will be an optimal functional which will give me an optimal bound. Okay. Uh, so these are called ex extremal functionals uh, for historical reasons. Uh, they map, these are the functions which correspond to optimal bounds. So what does it mean that the bound is optimal? A bound can only be optimal if there is a solution that saturates the bound, right? This is why the bound is optimal because it's not, you cannot improve it because it will rule out an existing solution. So if the bound is optimal, there exists a solution. So this solution, for instance, could take the form, this form. So there is some choice of delta n's and some choice of a n's such that this equation is satisfied where the gap, which is delta zero, would be the optimal gap. So the maximal gap that I could choose. So how is this compatible with the existence of a functional? It's compatible only if the following occurs. So first of all, our, our optimal functional, I told you that it had to be non-negative above the gap. And so we'll just demand that it should be exactly zero on the operators that make up this solution. Okay, so this is this condition. Furthermore, the optimal function on the identity, now it should be zero instead of strictly positive. So this is slightly subtle, but basically the optimal functional, you should think of it as a limiting functional. So at any step in the limit, you are actually demanding that the function should be strictly positive with some epsilon and then you are taking epsilon to zero. So the optimal functional, the asymptotic functional will actually uh, kill the identity. So you see, if these properties are true, then actually the functional, so you still demand that it's positive everywhere above the gap, not negative everywhere above the gap, so it's still a good functional, but it's compatible with this equation because if you just apply the function to this equation, it will kill the identity, it will kill these guys, so you'll just get zero equals zero. There's another condition here, which is a bit hidden, which is that the optimal functional not only kills the, the vectors in the optimal solution, but actually, in general, it will have to have double zeros, right? So I, let me see if I have a plot. Yeah, okay, I have a plot here. Why does it have to have these double zeros? It has because it's restricted to be positive, right? We want the function to be positive. so. The only way in which it can remain positive and at the same time have these zeros is if the zeros are double zeros. So schematically, our optimal functional would look like this. So it kills the identity. Then it, it flips sign here at delta gap. So delta zero is delta gap optimal. And then it has to be positive, non negative. And on these special values, delta one, delta two, so that the dimensions that make up the optimal solution, it will have to be zero. Okay. So there is a relation between the optimal functional and the optimal solution. Nevertheless, so once you found this functional, you know, you can act with this functional on any crossing equation that you want for any CFT. And so it will lead to an equation of this form, which has to be true. Okay. So this equation, I told you that it's trivially solved if the solution you are considering is the optimal one. But for a generic CFT, this is just some non-trivial sum rule on the OPE data of the CFT. So let us try to see what this, what this means in this case. So A delta is positive. And this optimal functional looks like this. And then it's supposed to give zero. How can it give zero? It can only give zero if positive contributions here above the gap, right? because I'm multiplying by positive coefficients here if the positive contributions here are canceled by negative contributions here. So if you can find the functional that has these properties, and then when you plot it looks like this, it will tell you something very interesting. It will tell you that any CFT would have to have at least one operator in this red region. Because if it does not, then everything would be positive, and there's no way that this solution could be uh, uh, satisfied. Okay? So questions about this?
Um, Miguel? Yes. So is delta G same as delta zero in your slide? Y yes, yes. This delta G is the same as delta zero. So I, I, it's here. And okay. so delta G optimal would be this. So the logic is that you construct these functional. These functionals, they might, they will be associated with some extremal solutions, but they are just functionals. So they can be applied to the crossing equation for any CFT. Okay. Um, so this is this perhaps this is just to motivate that perhaps one way, one interesting way with which to study the crossing equation is by thinking about linear functionals that act on the equation, which have nice positivity properties. Okay. So now let me give you a different motivation for considering functionals. So as I told you, this is a linear equation on the A deltas. So since this is a linear equation, perhaps something that you could try is to think of uh, introducing a basis. Okay, so these are a bunch of vectors. These F deltas are vectors in some space. So maybe we, sh we should try to introduce a basis in this space, okay? So we would write an F delta with arbitrary delta as some infinite sum over some specific uh, crossing vectors with specific delta n, which I'm not telling you what they should be, I don't know, with, and with some coefficients, which will depend on delta, okay? So if something like this existed, you see that if I, if I plug in this decomposition into this equation, then demanding that the coefficients of each basis element vanish becomes the sum rules, okay? So this is simply the statement that the coefficient of each of these terms in this sum has to vanish, okay? So this would be nice because you see that now, instead of working with a crossing equation, which depends continuously on Z, now we have an infinite set uh, of discrete, uh, a discrete set uh, of equations. It's still infinite, but at least it's discrete. And now, of course, the point is that these coefficients, you know, which are the important thing appearing in this equation, how can we compute them? Well, we can compute them by acting with functionals, right? So let us define functionals, the functional omega m that acts on a crossing vector and which has these, this duality property that Omega m on delta n is simply this Kronecker delta. Then if you take this functional and you act on this equation, then on the left you get omega n of f delta, and here it kills everything except one term. So it, it's easily seen to, to lead to, to tell you that c n delta is the action of this function on, on f delta. Okay. So what this is telling you then is that thinking about bases in this space is naturally associated to thinking about a dual basis of functionals. Okay, so again, we are seeing linear functionals making an appearance. There's a question in the chat box, Miguel. Uh, the question is, what's the orthogonality condition? The orthogonal, what, wait, what's this one? Uh, I don't know. The question says, what's the orthogonality condition? Uh, and uh, Pavan, if you have, if you can uh, explain your question, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. No. Um, no. Yeah. Um, excuse me, I have a question. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, could you please elaborate on the fact that why the basis parameters uh, become discrete in this case? Uh, ah, we don't. I don't know. Ah. Okay. You know, I don't know. Well, let us, I'm just, let us assume that something like this is possible. If we assume that something like this is possible, then these coefficients would be computed by these functionals and we'd get these sum rules. But you're right. I don't know. Maybe this, maybe this is impossible. We don't okay. know. Okay. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. It's a working hypothesis. Uh, So, so again, so if we introduce this basis, then the, the statement of crossing would be that the sum rules associated to these functionals would all be zero. But, but, but then what would this look like? Okay, so what are these functionals, I told you that they have these orthogonality properties, right? 
And so if we plot them, then the function would look like this, right? It would have to oscillate because it would flip signs at each of these deltas. So here it would be one, this is omega one, to be equal to one, but then here it has to be zero, so it will have to oscillate. So, okay, you know, this, is a, this would be a valid sum rule, but maybe it's not very useful because these negative regions will be all over the place. They will extend out to infinity. So, you know, maybe this will not teach you much. But, you know, from our previous uh, discussion with this bound on delta gap, it suggests that perhaps it would be better than to work with a, uh, a different basis, which will be positive. And so what, what does this basis look like? Well, so here it is. We postulate that there is a basis decomposition that looks like this. So you see that now F delta, I'm expanding it not only in terms of some special Fs, but also in terms of the derivatives of the Fs with respect to delta. And again, the coefficients in this expansion are functional actions as before. But now the, fun the orthogonality conditions, they're a bit more complicated because there are, no there are more basis vectors. So the alphas are the duals to these Fs. So, okay, so they still have this delta NM structure, but then they cannot be dual to these ones. They have to be orthogonal to these ones. So actually their derivatives at those points have to be zero. Okay, so the action of alpha N on this element is zero. And the betas are the, the reverse. So the betas are the, the functions which are dual to these guys. And so they have to kill all of these ones, which is this statement. And then when they act on these derivatives, then you get the square of the Okay? So if this basis decomposition exists with this dual basis satisfying these properties, then you see that this would be a lot better because now when I plot uh, these functionals, then these orthogonality conditions lead me to expect that there will be good positivity properties. And so the sum rules would have a lot more interesting consequences. Right? So again, plugging this, pl plugging this decomposition into the crossing equation leads to these sum rules. And since these are positive, this will give you some interesting bounds. I mean, notice, you see that this beta zero, notice that the, the form of the beta zero is exactly the same as that optimal functional that I plotted before. Okay? It's the same. Uh, so it's, it's not a coincidence. It's inspired by that, that we are defining this, this, uh, this basis. Of course, at this point, I have not proven anything. I don't know if this exists. Right? I have not proven that this exists. I have not proven that there are functions that compute, but anyway. This is kind of just a motivation for thinking about linear functionals with certain properties. Um, so there is a trivial solution of this equation. So if you set delta equals zero in the basis decomposition, if I, if I put the identity here, uh, and furthermore, I choose that the the beta functionals vanish on the identity that is so that they are zero here this is not guaranteed from this basis decomposition but so if i impose this then you see that this basis decomposition implies the existence of an extremal solution okay it follows automatically from this equation and this is probably what we want right because we don't want these functionals i mean these delta n's they cannot be just ra some random choice. We want them to be associated to the delta ends of a solution to crossing, because then these functionals would be the, the extremal functionals associated to that solution, and hence they should lead us to optimal bounds on something. So this is kind of a, gui a guiding principle. So not only do we want this basis decomposition, but we want to fine tune these delta ends such that they are associated to a special solution to crossing, what we would call an extremal solution. OK? So the message is that there are extremal solutions, and associated to them, presumably, there are these bases of functionals that encode this basis decomposition. So to summarize, and uh, then I think we should take a five-minute break, these results suggest that thinking about general functionals that act on the uh, 
on the bootstrap equation, nice functionals will lead to some rules with good positivity properties. And furthermore, the optimal or extremal functionals should be dual to certain extremal solutions to the bootstrap equation. Okay, so questions? Uh, Miguel, I have a question about the condition on these functionals. Uh, you are imposing that the, uh, at, at almost all, all of the zeros of these functionals, the, the first of the derivatives are, uh, vanish, uh, do vanish. But, but how, how do they guarantee that uh, these, these zeros are, uh, the multiplicity of these zeros are, uh, uh, are even? Because you, you want, you want nice positivity conditions, right? Yeah. So yeah. So uh, in, indeed, in principle, for all you know, the zeros could actually turn out to be cubic. And in mm -hmm. fact, these these, condi these conditions do not guarantee positivity, right? I could perfectly draw a functional which has all these properties, but maybe it, it flipped signs at some random point here. Uh, yes. And then all the double zeros would be on the wrong sides. So you're you're right. And in general, actually, this will happen. So some of these functions, when you plot them, actually they will not have nice positivity properties, but then you can combine them, you can form some linear combinations that will have these, uh, these properties. Uh, okay. okay, so, so there are some... Of, if, you, if you think this is like a guide or a motivation for finding functional satisfying these conditions, mm -hmm. but these are really the important, this is what all that you care about essentially. Then positivity will be a derived concept. In fact, you, yeah, you could think of writing down these basis decompositions to bootstrap solutions to crossing, which are not unitary, for instance. Okay. This basis decomposition would still be valid. So yeah, this is a motivation. You're right. It's, it's not a proof. Nothing tells you that these functionals behave like this. It's a, more of an expectation. Um, uh, okay, so maybe uh, we can meet uh, in five minutes. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, you can continue discussing uh, whoever wants to stay on. The, the, this link is going to be on. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just go away for one minute and, and come back. <laughs>
Can I ask a quick question? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, is it known that uh, one-dimensional conformal theories, um, uh, do we know if they can also have a continuous spectra of operator dimensions? If they have a continuous spectrum for, for what? For the, the, the scaling dimensions of the operators, uh, can, can they be continuous for one-dimensional theories, conformal theories? Or I'm asking true? because... Yes. Yeah. I'm asking because, uh, so, so higher dimensional CFTs, of course, for D greater than equal to three, they have a discrete spectra. But in two dimensions, it's possible to have continuous spectra also. So what is the right. scenario in one? Because it is kind of assumed, right, in what you did here, that the spectrum is discrete for the operator scaling dimensions. Is that right? I don't, no, not really. It's not really assumed, right? These, I'm writing things as sums, but in principle, you could write them as integrals. Okay, so this analytic function. Thinking. Yeah. So it's analytic functional and how it acts on uh, the data, all, the, all that goes through if you have a continuous spectra. I also. think so. Well, I mean, presumably, maybe there's some. Uh, I, I think in general, you can think of A delta as, as a distribution um, and everything will go through. Maybe there will have to be some technical assumptions on this distribution, but uh, yeah, nothing prevents you from going to the continuum, I think. So I, I, so you, for instance, if you have uh, something like Liouville or something, uh, I guess if you just if you take the Liouville some Liouville correlator where you have a continuous spectrum in the OP and you just set it on the line, then you'll see a continuous. Uh, this will be a solution uh, of these equations with the continuous spectrum, but you want uh, you want real scaling dimensions, right? Yes. Here you want real scaling dimensions. Real scaling dimensions, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Miguel, I have a question. Uh, yes. And yeah, I like to speak. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, like uh, when you are uh, constructing this analytic functionals, like you are uh, summing over some basis with sum of delta n's. So, like in general, we uh, like how to choose this basis. Like, can we choose like for uh, like pre theory basis for to construct these functionals? Or yeah. So, so here basically, when I wrote this, this is like to give you a flavor that. Even though in these lectures, I'm going to focus on a particular solution of these equations, which will be the generalized three fields, mm -hmm. and we'll construct functionals which are dual to that solution. I wanted to tell you that actually this approach is more general. Uh, and it should indeed hold for more general extremal solutions, which will be interacting. Uh, for those, there should also be some bases of functionals which are dual to them. It's just that we don't know how to construct them. We can construct them basically in perturbation theory, but not uh, non perturbatively. Uh, so, yeah, if you want these equations, they are, they, these are like a different way of formulating uh, uh, how we would obtain uh, these special solutions to crossing. Instead of thinking of directly trying to solve the crossing equation, you would demand that the basis decomposition of this form exists. Mm -hmm. where these coefficients beta n at zero, they would have to be zero. So finding such decompositions with these constraints would be equivalent to finding these solutions. Okay, like the question is that actually like in like to start with, we don't know what the sum over n's are, like what are the values of delta n's where we write yeah. down a complete That's base. Right. So That's right, we don't know. At this, at this point, we don't know. Or, yeah. Yeah, so we'll have to guess. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can start. Um, it's been more than. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Minutes. Excuse me, Miguel. Uh, I had a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, suppose delta naught is the optimal bound, and then you have a associated functional with it, so which you are calling extremal functional, let's say. Yes. Then uh, is this extremal functional uh, unique 
I'm it's saying that functional unique. I, I well, I think in well, no, I, in general, given the bounds, I think there could be more than one functional that's given it. So, for instance, in higher dimensions where there are these kinks, yep. then on one side of the kink, there's one functional, and on the other side, there's a different one. Okay. So the functional does not have to be unique now. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so now let's talk about functional basis then. So we're going to think about very general after all this story, we want to think about general linear functionals that act on the crossing equation. So let us discuss a bit the kinematics. So this crossing vector, uh, it's a function that's analytic in some region on the complex plane, which I'll call R. So R is the complex plane modulus the, the semi-infinite lines that go from infinity to zero and from one to infinity. So it looks like this. This is my region R. Incidentally, this R is the region of convergence of the crossing equation. Okay, this sum over deltas with these crossing vectors, it will converge in this region. Notice that this region is homeomorphic to a disk. If you do some, some formal map. Um, since the crossing vector is analytic, well, let us do a very uh, trivial thing. So let's just use Cauchy's theorem. So we have this contour here. And we have a, we put a pole z minus w, and then this tells us that the, the crossing vector at a, a generic point w is given by this integral. And now we blow up the contour so that it wraps, it wraps the two cuts. Since f is anti-symmetric in w, actually it's sufficient to, you can fold the picture by anti-symmetry and focus just on one of the cuts. So now there are two poles because of this anti-symmetry property. And so a different representation of the same f is, is this. Okay, so you see the, con the, the, the integral now goes from one to infinity. This, this double integral has become the, this iz, which is the discontinuity of f across the cuts. And you get two of these terms. So these two poles become this. OK, so this is just a triviality. It's just a different way of writing f in terms of its discontinuities. But now let us reinterpret this. So f, the, f delta w, I could think of this actually as the action of a linear functional on the crossing vector. It's a special functional, which is called the, F, the evaluation functional. It's the functional. It depends on the parameter w. And when it acts on f delta, it gives f delta evaluated at w. So it's kind of a trivial functional, but it is a functional. It takes the function f delta and returns its value at a particular point. So this functional, as a function of delta, we just shown that it's computed in this following way. It's an integral over this discontinuity of f times a certain kernel. And in this case, we know the kernel. OK, so now we're going to generalize. We're going to consider linear functionals, omega of delta, which also look like this. OK? This, now we're going, the, the only difference is that the, the analytic structure here, this h had two poles here. Now we're going to allow more general behavior and we'll assume that H can have discontinuities in the real axis. Okay? So if you want, this is an ansatz for a very large class of linear functionals that can act on F. Okay? So in practice, a, a different formulation is more convenient. So you start off with this representation, which involves this contour integral. And now you can deform the contour so such that it looks like this. Okay, so you open it up. And now you take it to infinity, and it wraps this green cut here, and then it goes down. And so now it's the sum of two pieces. There's a piece which runs vertically, which is called the f piece. So this will look like this. So the integral goes from a half to a half plus i infinity. And then there's a different piece, which, which knows about the discontinuity of h across this green cut. OK? And so this piece will depend on a function which are called f. And this piece depends on a function I call g. And roughly speaking, f is the antisymmetric part of h, roughly. And then g is the discontinuity of h. Okay, so this is, a, this is an equivalent formulation that I can obtain by counter deformation, assuming that I can deform the contour. 
So sorry, to summarize, the very sorry, Miguel, this choice that it uh, it is half plus i infinity. This half is a choice, or is there some reason why you've chosen half? Uh, I chose a half because half half plus i infinity under crossing it maps to complex conjugation, right? One half plus i infinity goes into one half minus i infinity. I, I see, I see, I see. Okay. And so this is why this integral. You see, it's it's only going upwards uh -huh. here. Okay. So I'm I'm admitting the uh, I'm being a bit fast, but so yeah, and also so the H W uh, it is a function which can have cuts, but it does not have any poles. Or, or, or what is the restriction? It could have poles. It could be poles. Yeah, it could have oh. poles. I mean, uh, it will have some analytic structure. Here, but I'm assuming that it's analytic on the upper and half or in lower half planes. Okay. And but even that you can relax. So you can see you can assume any analytic structure that you want. Okay. So basically, this ansatz just relies on analyticity of f here in the upper half plane, lower half planes. So to and sorry, and the, sorry, and the and the and the at at uh, infinity this age how, how does it how does it need to behave? Can it grow? It, this will depend on the on the on the. It depends. You can choose whatever you want. So it, it will have to decay sufficiently fast, at least to to allow for this contour deformation, right? Yeah, so you, have to, you have to look at how this decays. So it depends on how this decays. Uh, it's actually it's even a bit more complicated, but I'll discuss that in, in a moment. But I mean, the, the message is that at the end, um, there is this, this is just an ansatz for our functional. F has this symmetry property. Um, and if you want, you can completely forget about H. Once you have this representation, you can completely forget that this arose by some contra deformation of some h. The only thing that's left of, of that is this condition, which I, it's called the, the, the gluing condition. Okay, so if you look at what f and g are in terms of h, they imply this condition. And this is sufficient to reconstruct the h if you want. So I will not think about h anymore. I will just use this representation and keep in mind that at the end of the day, I would like to impose this. But this is so this is just some ansatz. A very general ansatz. Okay, so now related to the question, uh, this, this question that I had before, how should we choose these delta n's? So I will aim for a functional basis which is dual to generalized free fields, because this is the only solution that I've spoken about here, anyway. <laughs> So there's none other that I could have chosen. Um, and this is simple, right? The structure of the spectrum is very, it's very easy. So, so the delta n's, uh, they have this simple structure. It's just 2 delta 5 plus 2n or 2 delta 5 plus 2n plus 1. Uh, so this is what I'm going to try to aim for. And uh, so these functionals, you saw from the, the, the orthogonality conditions, they have to have double zeros, right? They have to have a lot of double zeros. So I want them to have double zeros either here or here. So there will be two sets of functions, one for the boson and one for the fermion. And I'll do the analysis roughly at the same time, but at the end, it will be two distinct bases. And so what is the idea then? So we want to have double zeros at these values. So how we'll do this is that the functional is the sum of two pieces, this G piece and this F piece. And this G piece is not oscillating as a function of delta. So I'll think of this as a one. And this f, since it's getting integrated on the on the upper half plane, this will oscillate as a function of delta. So roughly, I will think of this as a cosine. And you know from elementary trigonometry that if you combine a 1 with a cosine, you can get sine squares. Sine squares give you double zeros, which is what we want. OK? So we want base functionals which will have double zeros at these values, because they will the dual, this is what we want to have a basis, dual to generalize free fields. And so I'll try to do this. So the key, the key property that allows this to, to, to work and that we can make this computation very simply uh, is that conformal blocks, they have cuts uh, for negative values of their arguments, which are very simple. So basically they just pick up a phase, okay? So you, if you look at the expression for the conformal block that I gave you, you can prove this. And so this is where this is what's going to give me the cosine. So after some counter tricks, which may not be valid, 
uh, we'll have to worry about them later. It's possible to arrive at the following representation of omega delta. So here's the GPs. Now it's the integral is from zero to one instead of a half to one. And here's the FPs. So I've deformed the contour such that it's on the real axis. And this cosine came from uh, from this phase here. Okay. So, okay, so I want to get a sine squared, so I'm going to choose to relate G and F so, such that this becomes a one and this becomes another one. So I choose to relate G with F in this way. If you do that, then the functional action becomes sine squared times this integral. Uh, well, it looks slightly different for the boson and the fermion, but indeed, it, so if you impose this condition, the functional action will look like this, so great. We have a functional action which will have double zeros at the GFF, which is what we wanted. But this is not the end of the story because you recall that there was this gluing condition, right? So I cannot just choose G to be, to, I cannot just choose G to be equal to F in this way. Uh, I want to impose this gluing condition. And so if I plug in what G is in the gluing condition, then I get this equation. Which, is, which I call the fundamental free equation. And so these functionals, which are dual to generalize free fields, they have to satisfy uh, this equation. So epsilon, I'm not sure if I defined it or not. So epsilon is plus or minus one. So epsilon is this sign here. Okay. So I think I, think I forgot to define it. So we've reduced the problem of finding functions with double zeros on GFF to solving this equation. So how can we solve it? And uh, what do we mean by solving it? Because in general, we require boundary conditions. So this is a complicated equation, right? Uh, sorry? Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. So why did we have to introduce uh, F and G? If we did all of these analyses just using H, would have been so much more complicated? It would be equivalent. OK. It would be exactly equivalent. Have... But we wouldn't have to introduce the gluing condition, so maybe one step would be skipped. No, well, it would be it would be implicit. Yeah. So, so why would so, so the to... gluing condition? The gluing condition would get replaced by something else, which would be the same. Once you write it in terms of F and G. Oh. So, uh, I mean, you cannot but get H around. But H was arbitrary before, no? Yes, oh. but when you write what, when you try to come up with this uh, form of the function which has a sine squared. Oh. You have to impose some conditions on H. I see. And one of those conditions amounts to this one. I see. Okay. So it's 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 completely equivalent. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. So uh, if you take F to be real, then F and G are the two discontinuities of H, one between zero and one, and one from minus infinity to zero. So it's uh, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, and at the end, H is more complicated than F and G. So this is why it's better to work with F and G. Uh, so again, we have to solve them in subject to what boundary condition. So, okay, we stare at this equation and look, there's a simple solution. Uh, let's just try uh, FZ a constant. You can see that if you set epsilon equals minus one, which is appropriate for the generalized free fermion, and if you choose delta phi to be three halves, then it solves this equation. And indeed, when you look at the functional action uh, given by this f, so what do I mean by this? I mean that you, you take this, you take this equation, you plug it into Mathematica, you put f equals one, and you set g to be related by f. So I mean, these are all well-defined things. You just put this in Mathematica and compute it and plot it. When you plot it, it gives this. So here are here are my double zeros. Okay. Here, there's not a double zero, it's a simple zero. And then something goes horribly wrong here, it diverges. And actually this branch, you cannot obtain it. You, have, you can only obtain it by analytic, uh, by analytic continuation. So this Mathematica thing that I was telling you, computing the, the functional action directly would not work here. Okay, so what went wrong? What went wrong is that the functional action, it, it involves these two integrals. So we have to worry about what happens at the, the end points we want the functional action to be finite. So finiteness, so it, it will depend on the structure of this f delta. So f delta, when z goes to 1, it behaves like a power law, delta minus 2 delta 5. 
So you see that it will diverge the more strongly, the smaller that delta is. So the worst case is when delta is equal to zero. And so we need to impose suitable restrictions on G. So we need to impose that G when Z goes to one, it, it has to decay sufficiently fast. Similarly, at infinity, if you look at the behavior of F at infinity, then it, it's, it decays like one over Z equal to delta phi. And so this also requires uh, an appropriate behavior on F. And you can see that this behavior is violated by our solution. So if I set delta phi equals uh, uh, th three halves, that, no, so actually this one is fine. It's this one that will get violated. Uh, and there's a final important catch, which is, which I call crossing compatibility, which is that functionals, they must be finite not only on individual crossing vectors, but they have to be finite on infinite sums. Right, so because initially the functional acts on the infinite sum, and you want it to commute, you want it to be linear, right? So you want to take the sum out of the functional. And so actually, when you look at the behavior at infinity, we have to study the behavior not only of an individual crossing vector, but of infinite sums. And here we remind ourselves that um, I told you that CFT correlators at Z goes to infinity, they are bounded by one. So a long time ago. I, I, I spoke about this. So here is this condition. And so actually F is more constrained. It's, con it's more constrained than what we had. So it's, it's a stronger constraint than this one. Okay, so F has to fall off at least like one over Z. And it actually it will have to, if F is analytic, it will have to fall off like one over Z squared at least. And so our F, which was F equals one, violates this condition. So it's not a good functional. Uh, okay, so, so what we need to do is to solve this equation uh, subject to these boundary conditions. And when you do that, you find that there's an infinite set of solutions. Okay? Uh, this infinite set of solutions can be labeled by the behavior of this kernel f when z approaches zero. So for instance, when epsilon is minus one, which corresponds to the fermion, then I could have either a power law divergence and this, I'll say that it's associated with the beta n functional, or they can have a power law divergence times a log, and then I'll say that it's associated with the alpha. Okay. So again, the, this this uh, the fact that these are the only solutions allowed comes out of this equation automatically. So, for instance, the fact that n has to be an integer which is larger than zero comes out automatically of this equation. I do not have to impose it. So now let us try to understand why this boundary condition is associated with these guys and why this one is associated with those guys. The reason is simple. So for instance, imagine that we take what I call the beta n f functional, the fermionic functional. So the functional action was the sine squared, and then there was this g kernel times the block. Uh, so this boundary condition on f at z equals zero is uh, tra it's the same one on g because f and g are related. So if I look at this integrand, in the vicinity of z goes to zero, the block gives me z to the delta minus two delta phi, and this kernel will diverge. And so actually this integral is divergent when delta is equal to one plus two delta phi plus two n. This divergence will, be ca will cancel partially the double zero. But this is perfect, right, because these functionals, they have to be orthonormal. So they cannot just have double zeros. At some point, they have to have a one. And in particular, the beta functional, you see that one of the zeros has to be a first order zero. And furthermore, it has to occur precisely when delta is equal to delta m. And so this expression precisely gives us this. This beta and f will have double zeros all the way down to when delta is equal to delta. So this is the this is the reason why we link this to beta functions and the log is the same. The log gives a double pole, so the double pole kills completely the double zero, and so the, the they will have a one. Notice that the the functional action is still finite, so this integral is divergent. So what went wrong is that to arrive at this representation, I told you that we have to do some counter manipulations, and these counter manipulations fail when delta is sufficiently small. But the original representation of the functional in terms of an integral with an f and a g is still finite. 
by our boundary conditions. So this is a bit uh, detailed, but so the message that I want to to tell you is that this this equation automatically gives you functionals which have the right properties that we want, these orthonormal functionals, even though we didn't assume it from the start. We just asked for, for double zeros, and this is telling us that we cannot just have double zeros, we have to have things which are orthonormal in the right way. Um, so how do we actually find solutions um, very quickly? So for special values of delta phi, we can just do an ansatz. So I gave you a solution, right? When delta phi is equal to three halves, f equals one works. And it turns out that there are more complicated ansatz which will give you other solutions. And then for general values of delta phi, you can extrapolate from these ansatzes. So maybe I, I'm going to skip this. What's important is that we, we know how to completely solve for all these kernels. So at the end of this procedure, what we are left, left with is with explicit functionals, which for instance, for the fermion, take exactly the form that we wanted. So there's some beta ends, there's some alpha ends, and they satisfy these, the right duality conditions. Okay? And we find precisely one kernel for each such functional, and there are no other solutions. Okay? So this procedure knows in a sense about the generalized free fermion solution, right? Because this integer n, in principle, who tells me that it has to be a non-negative integer? Maybe it could have been a negative number. But the equation with the correct boundary conditions automatically knows about the correct spectrum. Uh, so just to give you some, yeah, so these are just some examples of the, the functional kernels. So for instance, the, the, the fermionic functionals for delta pi equals a half, F said, you can just explicitly write it down. You can see it's, it's simple. It's just some Legendre polynomials. And this is the result for general delta phi. It's more complicated. But okay. This is just to tell you that we have the explicit uh, solutions. I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Now, for the boson, now for the bosonic functional, there is a surprise. Now the scaling dimensions are 2 delta phi plus 2m. And you find, again, this comes out of the equation, we did not assume it, that the functionals that you can construct, they don't quite give you the orthonormality relations that you want. So here, this term should not be here. And here, this term should not be here. So there's a delta m zero. So there's a problem with the delta zero guy. And indeed, the beta zero functional does not exist. We cannot find it. OK? So this dn and cn, they are just computable from the equation. And you find that there's no beta 0 b. So this, uh, maybe you, you, you should be worried of this. So does this mean that this procedure does not make sense? And what, uh, what, what is going on? So I will get back to that issue in a, mo in a moment. Uh, but the summary then, it seems to suggest that there are two bases. There's a fermionic basis for f delta, which involves f delta nf and the derivative f delta nf, where these are the fermionic uh, dimensions. And there's a dual basis made up of these functionals. And for the boson, it's almost the same thing, but there is a guy missing. So this derivative of f when n equals 0 is not present because there's a functional missing. And so the claim is that in principle there is there exist equations of this sort which allow us to uniquely write a, a crossing vector in an expansion in terms of this basis where the coefficients are computable in terms of functionals that we discussed okay so i should say that actually we i didn't really prove that these equations are are correct i just what i've proved is that if an equation of this form exists then there exist functionals which compute its coefficients correctly. So it's a subtle difference. But, uh, um, okay, so now let us discuss this uh, this issue with the bosonic uh, uh, basis. Sorry, Miguel, are you going to address that subtle issue uh, in your future lectures, or is that something that I, I will? I will. Okay, okay. Yes. So it, indeed, it, it's it's an it's a very important uh, property, right? I have not proved that this mm -hmm. decomposition rule is actually correct. Right. I've just proved that if an equation like this exists, then I 
then it will have coefficients computed by these functions. You could imagine that there will be some remainder function here, which would kill, be killed by all these functionals. In principle, it could exist. Uh, but later I'll show that, the, that this is actually correct. Okay. okay, so now let us understand this, uh, this uh, subtlety with the boson basis. So let us write an equation. Let us assume that an equation like this exists. And let us try to compute what these coefficients are. So where here delta n are the boson values, 2 delta 5 plus 2n. So we simply act with the functionals on both sides of the equations. And this gives that beta n of delta is equal to dn minus dn d0. And uh, well, so you get these equations. Uh, and uh, so b0, you see that it's, it's not fixed by these equations. Uh, every coefficient, every bn, and so dn and cn, recall, are the things that appear in the orthonormality conditions. So this cn and dn, they, are, they follow from the construction of the functionals. We know what these numbers are. They come out of, the, of this equation for the functionals. Uh, and so it, uh, these functionals cannot completely fix this equation. There's a free parameter because I am missing an equation. Right? There's no beta zero. If there was a beta zero, I would be able to fix completely these coefficients. Um, so actually, this implies that there is a solution. So there is a zero mode that, or a homogeneous solution to the equation that looks like this. So you take this equation. If you plug in zero here, then you get zero equals this and zero equals this. So you are able to fix all the coefficients in terms of dn and cn and b0 we can set to y. Okay, so the functionals are telling us that there exists a solution of this form. Okay, now is this a solution? I mean, this is a solution to crossing. Do have we ever seen it before? And actually, we have, um, because this is nothing but the crossing equation for a certain correlator, which is a contact term in ADS. So if you compute this Witten diagram in ADS2, this gives rise to to a function g0, which looks like this. Okay, so this is not a bona fide uh, CFT correlator, right? Because this is a uh, this, this this function appears in a perturbative expansion of a CFT correlator. This is why there's a derivative of a, of a conformal block here. Nevertheless, this is just this is some mathematical function, okay, which exists, which is crossing symmetric, so it gives rise to an equation of this form. And cru crucially, it's Regie bounded. So this correlator, at when z goes to infinity, it decays like one over z. The reason why we didn't find this in the fermionic basis is that the analogous contact term for the fermions grows like z. It's not Regie bounded. And the key assumption in solving this functional equation, we had to impose that correlators at, at infinity they grow they go like a constant. Right? This is a very important assumption because it, it's, it forced on us that the functional kernels had to decay like 1 over z squared. Okay? So they do so, not. Sorry, can I clarify that statement? Uh, so you said that the correlators are bounded uh, by a constant. So uh, the way that you argued was uh, you looked at the GFF and then. That actually told you that it goes like a constant. Uh, but then for a general spectrum, the. Well, that was yeah. an example, but I told you that there was a general argument. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so but, but the general argument you didn't. Uh, uh, you I, I didn't give it. The, I didn't give it in detail. No, so you have to consider the modulus. It's basically the, the, the large z limits. If you take the modulus, it's it be, it's exactly it's essentially the same thing as the t channel OPE. Mm -hmm. Once you take the modulus, and so it will be dominated by the identity, and uh, so it will give you this one. Okay. Yeah, the, the argument is written in, in our paper. It's, it's a very simple argument. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any correlator is bounded by one. So again, any CFT, physical CFT correlator. I mean, this guy is not really a physical CFT correlator, right? Because uh, there's derivatives of conformal blocks. So the argument that tells you that correlators are bounded by one does not work for this function. This is why these functions can have more general behavior. 
So which leads me to my, uh, uh, maybe this will also help clarify. So here we found a particular contact term, but what about all the other ones? In general, there's an infinite set of solutions to this equation. Okay, this homogeneous crossing equation involving the GFF dimensions. Okay, so this equation, these infinite solutions correspond to crossing symmetry for a certain coral layer, GK, which is computed by considering contact terms in ADS with 4K derivatives. Importantly, this correlator, at, when z goes to infinity, it goes like 1 over z times z to the 2k. Okay? And so the only such correlator that we can bootstrap with our functionals is the one with k equals 0. But now suppose you tell me, well, but I want to also bootstrap the other ones. How could I do it? Well, it's very simple. Since you want to consider correlators which can grow faster at infinity, you will have to consider functionals whose kernels decay faster as well. Okay? So if we demand that our functional kernels, when z goes to infinity, now they go like 1 over z to the 2 plus 2k, so this is a stronger restriction, now they can bootstrap these correlators. But since this is a stronger restriction, the, the equation that we, will solve, will solve, that we were solving for the functional it will have less solutions. In particular, if you do this, you will find that not only beta 0, but beta 1, beta 2, and so on, all the way to beta k, all these functionals will have to be 0. Okay? So if there are more functionals which are 0, then when you apply the functionals to this equation, there will be more leftover variables. So there will be more solutions. Right? So here, there was this B0 variable, which was left over because beta 0 was 0. If now there are more functions which are 0, there will be more leftover variables. And those, those leftover variables are precisely what will allow you to bootstrap all the contact terms up to 4k derivatives. OK? So I mean, this is a not a super important uh, well, it is important to some extent. So in the fermionic basis, we see that this issue did not appear. For the bosonic basis, basis it, it does appear. Uh, but uh, we can mostly forget about it in, in what will follow. Why in the fermionic basis does it not appear? I mean, can't we have uh, contact terms like psi, psi bar psi, psi bar psi? It's because the first contact term in that case, it, it's, uh, if I didn't make a mistake, maybe, maybe I'd no, I think this is correct. The first, the first contact term in that case, it grows like Z. So indeed, those contact terms are there, mm -hmm. and you can bootstrap them. But to bootstrap them, you would start to, to you would have to start to impose uh, stronger constraints on the kernel. So if okay. you just impose the correct constraints suitable for bootstrapping correlators bounded by one, okay. you will not see any of these contact terms because there is no contact term for the fermions which is bounded by one. I think. It's a difference. The bosons, uh, yes, because it's fermion, so you have to put some extra derivatives. So the Reggie behavior will be different. It will be shifted from that of the boson. Okay. Yeah. So th this is crucial. Um, so basically, I'm at the end. Managed to do this exactly on time. Um, so starting from some some nice ansatz. We've obtained bases of functions. So I'm putting bases between quotes because I haven't really explained why these things are bases. Uh, we just found a bunch of functions which are dual to the generalized free boson and generalized free fermion solution. This is what we've rigorously shown. These functions exist. And we've, and, and we've also rigorously shown that if a solution, if they're given a solution to crossing, so a solution to this equation, it will have to satisfy these sum rules. This is what we've shown so far. We've constructed functionals which I can apply to this equation, swap them to get these sum rules. Okay? Now, you can ask about the reverse implication. If I, if I find a set of OP coefficients which satisfies all these sum rules, does that imply that the crossing equation is satisfied? And this, this is related to this basis decomposition that I showed you. Huh? So this is the question of completeness. So it's the question of completeness, and it's the question of whether these things are a basis in, 
This is the sense in which these things could be a basis of functions if solving all these constraints would be equivalent to solving this equation. Right now, we have not shown this. We've only shown that this equation implies this one, but not the reverse. So that's one thing. And the second thing then is now that we have these functionals, you know, so these, these functions now, you can just plot them and you can see what these sum rules look like. And you can see what do they imply for general CFT data. So they will imply both bounds on the CFT data and we'll also be able to use these equations to deform solutions to crossing in perturbation theory. So if there's one thing that I would want to, to, to emphasize, uh, maybe to head off some questions is that I, I, I was, I kept speaking about generalized free fields and free CFTs and whatnot and D equals one CFTs. But if you want, you can forget about all that. I just told you that there exists some functions, alpha n of delta and beta n of delta, which we know how to compute once and for all. These are just some universal functions. Forget about GFFs. And any CFT, any hypothetical CFT, if you give me its OP data in terms of SL2R primaries, it will have to satisfy these equations. So it has nothing to do with GF, with free theory. So any CFT will have to satisfy these conditions. So this is an, often a confusion. So, and uh, that's it. Thank you. You're muted. Let's un unmute ourselves and clap for Miguel for a very nice lecture. Okay, questions. Uh, let me let me ask you a couple. So uh, one of them is that uh, in one D CFT, why do you use the terminology regi bounded? Where is this? I thought regi bounded was uh, inherited from fixed T largest behavior in in scattering. Why did I use this terminology? Uh, there's a couple of different answers. The, the simplest one is that if you think of the 1D CFT as, as a higher dimensional CFT on the line, then this limit where Z goes to, to, to infinity, it's the CFT regi limit in the U channel. It's the U channel regi limit. Okay, so that comes from the higher dimensional intuition. Yes, this is from the higher dimensional interpretation. And the second question was that when you're talking about uh, decomposing uh, the operators in a high dimensional CFT in terms of SL2R primaries, yes. are you suggesting that the, the data that you're going to recover are in terms of SL2R blocks and then you have to reconvert them into the, uh, the, the appropriate blocks in that particular dimension? Um... I mean, so the constraint, the constraint is, that, yeah, so, so for higher DCFTs, all these SL2R primaries, they will have to regroup themselves into, mm -hmm. so I am not, in, I mean, I'm not imposing those constraints. Those would be extra constraints. I mean, it's easy to generalize these sum rules to allow for that, right? So these functionals, this alpha n of delta, they are, it's functions when they act on an SL2R primary, but the functions, they can act on actually on, on entire conformal blocks in higher D. So this is a way of imposing those constraints. So real, the only information that you lose is that of spin. The one of SL2R you can impose automatically by, by promoting these functional actions to actions that on the higher di dimensional conformal blocks. I don't know if that's uh, what you meant. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, you can just check. You can just, you, you can take, you can do it either way. You can take, a, yeah, take your favorite CFT correlator, like 2D easing, and you, if you decompose it into, into SL2R blocks, it will satisfy mm -hmm. the rule. Yes. But the delta, uh, I mean, if I just decompose the 2D in terms of the SL2R blocks, the delta that appears in that, that equation is not the uh, delta of the, uh, 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 does not correspond to the de uh, conformal dimensions of the, the two dimensionalizing model, right? I mean, some, some of them, some of them will. Just okay. that they will come in towers. Uh, let's take the 3D easing such that there are no degeneracies. So the first operator is 1.41, right? Uh -huh. So in the 1D perspective, there would be an operator with 14.1, 3.41, 5.41. You left an infinite tower. And then there will be another guy with dimension 3.84, and then 5.84, 7.84, blah, blah, blah. 
Then there will be the stress tensor tower, which would be an right, operator yeah, yeah, three, okay. and then five, seven. So you'd see these. Yeah, the lowest towers. one will be okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, Andrea yeah, you would, has a question. You would see, indeed, you would see the you would see the correct dimensions lying at the bottom of these towers. Okay. Okay. So it's and, still Andrea, super non-trivial. Right. Yeah. So uh, going back to those contact terms that you had, um, if I expand them instead of expanding them in the generalized free theory blocks, I expand them in the user conformal blocks. Uh, do I get like? So, 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 well, what do you mean? What do you what do you mean? That there's only one kind of conformal blocks. No, I know the conformal blocks are those, but if I expand them like in a different set of deltas, do I get to expand them in like a finite? You cannot. You, are, you you cannot. You cannot. You are not free to choose. No, because. I mean, like if I take any other theory, I can expand them in this G delta N, but I can also expand them in the actual uh, deltas of the spectrum. No? no, you cannot expand them in terms of G delta N. You, you have to expand them always in terms of the Gs of the spectrum. Yeah, so so the spectrum of this, uh, the spectrum of these contact terms is always the generalized free field. Yeah, because this is just the contact, this is just a lambda five fourth interaction in ADS2. Uh, so it's a free scalar, and yeah. then you add a perturbative coupling phi fourth, and you compute this. You compute the the tree level diagram corresponding to this. So uh, this is the this is how you can interpret interpret this. So the, the meaning of this function is that there should be a coupling constant sitting outside here, and then this corresponds to a shift in the OP coefficients of the double trace operators, and this is a shift in the dimension. Okay. This is, no, but, this is how you interpret this. But this is just a mathematical thought, function which has this decomposition and no other one. No, because I thought, like, let's say I take the easy model, I can do with the functional an expansion in the G delta n, but I can also expand it in the dimensions of the primaries of the theory. No? And you can two. only, then, I don't know that you can, you cannot expand it in terms of G delta n. You can only expand it in the Gs of the, of the theory. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, his confusion, uh, his question is, uh, you have uh, uh, the conformal blocks form a complete basis, and so you'll have you should be able to expand it in terms of the what he's calling the traditional conformal blocks. But you uh, have an expansion which is a little bit different. So you have G delta, no, 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 but, delta but, partial, no, no, partial but, G yeah, delta. no, but this is important. So my expansion is not for the blocks. My expansion is for the crossing vector. It's very different. So I claim mm -hmm. that the crossing vector can be written like this. Yes, crossing vector. That's this this does not mean that. A conformal block can be written in terms of conformal right. blocks. This is that's wrong. I see. So this is the statement. It's it's very different because when you when you expand for z, z goes to zero, if this if these were all conformal blocks and you expanded for z equals zero, you would only get one term on each. But the crossing vectors, when you expand goes to z, uh, to z goes to zero, you have to you have to resum this series to get the correct behavior here. So uh, yeah, the, this is an important point. Okay, so the contact terms are that what that, that we saw before with the expansion in conformal blocks. Okay, I see. Yeah, so this is just there is a function. There is a there exists some some crossing symmetric function which has this form. Period. Um, yeah, which which explains why there's this missing functional for the boson. That's okay. that's it. I, mean, I will emphasize this more in the next lecture, but uh, something again, something that can confuse people is that ah, but these functionals you have to they they only apply for perturbation theory or blah blah blah. So you should just think of these. So this is a mathematical identity between functions. Because I and thought they, that this was somehow related to the to the solutions of HPPS, which they have a finite uh, a finite support in spin, so they are like a finite number of conformal blocks. I thought this was related to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, those solutions are just contact terms in ADS. Yeah, but they are so, they are in a finite number of spins. They take up a finite number of spins, so it seems to be different. Yeah. No, it's the same. I, I, no, I mean they couple a finite number of spins, but an infinite number of dimensions. Ah, okay. So okay, the, the sum in spins is fa so. In higher dimensions, you have a sum not only over n here, but there's also a sum over l, the spin. And contact okay, terms okay, in higher okay. dimensions, the sum over spins is bounded indeed. But here in 1D, there's no spin, so you only see this sum over, over okay, dimensions. Okay, uh, any other questions? 
Uh, maybe I have one. So did I understand correctly that the kernels for all these uh, functionals are written in terms of 3F2 or something like that? Uh, yeah, so let me go back. So yeah, I was a bit fast here. So there are two statements. So first of all, for special values of the scaling dimension, delta phi, we can construct the, the precise kernels for all the beta n's and alpha n's with the right orthonormality properties, which are these ones. OK? Mm -hmm. So you can just get them on the nodes. What happens for general delta phi? For general delta phi, we do it in two steps. First, we construct the smallest functional, so that so beta 0 and alpha 0, and they are given in terms of some 3F2s. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. how, how do we get the beta n's? This is, a, this is a more complicated. So there, we do not have a general closed form expression. For any n, we can construct it, but we don't have a general closed form expression for all n. So it comes from mm -hmm. this trick. So the trick is that the, that the equation which you are trying to solve has the following property, that if you have a solution at some value of delta phi, then there is a different solution um, at, at the same value of delta phi, but where you multiply by some factor, this factor, z squared. Now, what is the importance of this? You recall that the, the behavior near z equals 0 of the functional kernels is what controls whether the functional is beta 0 or beta 1 or beta 2 or whatever. It depends on the divergence here. So this is telling you that if you know beta 0 for all delta phi, you can construct beta n for any n. The only catch is that when you do this, you get functions which will not be fully orthonormal. So they will have the correct orthonormality properties um, when m is larger than n, but not when m is smaller than n. And so there's some Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization that you have to do. Mm -hmm. but it's, finite. it's a finite Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. So. I see, I see. So the message is that we don't have a closed form for general delta phi for all the, for the orthonormal functions, functionals, um, but for any n, we can do this Gram-Schmidt uh, procedure to, to get the, the orthonormal ones. Usually, if you're doing numerical computations, you don't care, actually, because you just need some basis of functionals, and you're going to truncate it at some large value of n anyway. So you can work with any basis of functionals that, that you want. I see. OK, Th this was my next sort of question, uh, whether it's easy to to do computations with, with these functionals, or I, I mean, yeah. numerical ones, for example. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so you can just, I don't, this PDF presumably will be made available somewhere. Uh, like you can just take, you know, plug this into mathematics. So this is a Legendre polynomial. Just plug yeah. this into mathematics. So all the information is contained in this talk, and you just have to compute uh, whatever this integral. Um, Right? It's defined here. You know what f is. You know what g is. Do this integral in mathematics, and you'll get some function of delta. And then you can check whether your favorite solution to crossing satisfies the, the sum rule. Right. So for instance, something, something easy to do is that you can take a fermionic. So the fermionic functionals, they're automatically dual to the fermionic GFF. So it's easy to check that, GF, that, that generalized free fermion satisfies the fermionic sum rule. It's a triviality. But it's not trivial to check, say, that the generalized free boson satisfies the sum rules of the fermionic functions and vice versa. But you can check. Yeah. So you can, everything is contained in this talk. You can put it in mathematics and check that it works. I see. I see. Right. Thank, thanks. OK, so I think. Uh... It was a long lecture, so I think Miguel deserves some rest. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe you can put it up in the Slack channel and uh, he can have a look at it later. Or uh, maybe at the beginning of next lecture, you can ask your questions. So let's thank Miguel again. And we reconvene um, at the same time, 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time uh, next Friday. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thanks a lot.